we count down. Hello, hi, and welcome. Welcome to Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood. I'm Alta's digital editor. I am so excited to welcome you um, for a very special Alta Live with today's guest, illustrator Victor Yuhas. Victor is a multiple award-winning illustrator whose extraordinary work has been published in and on major magazines, newspapers, television networks, advertising agencies, and in books, both adult and children's books. In fact, he is working on another children's book right now. Um, Victor's, in, Victor's eclectic career is um, fascinating. I. It's, uh, you're really in for a treat today. If you are unfamiliar with Victor's work and just come to Alta Lives, this is gonna be really um, fun. And if you're a Victor Yuhas fan, we're gonna check out his process and his work. We're gonna talk about the numerous artistic roles he's held. Um, and then we're gonna answer your questions. Before we get to all of that, some brief housekeeping. Um, Alta Live is the digital event series we do here at Alta Journal. I'm Beth, I'm Alta's digital editor. And if you're unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. We run a California book club, a monthly California book club. We've got book review newsletters, a weekly newsletter. We do events like this. Um, if you like what you see here today, I hope you check us out at altaonline.com. Um, there is a Q&A button down at the bottom. Please use that to ask any questions you have of Victor. We will get to as many questions, um, as many of your questions as we can um, towards the end of this interview. We're going to speak for about 30, 35 minutes today. Um, and let's get things started. Oh, we're going to, this is being recorded. We'll send you a link. Don't worry. This will be hosted on altaonline.com later today. Let's get the chat started. Please share your location. Um, it's always fun to see where people are zooming in from. So if you can start the chat off by letting us know where you're zooming in from today. I'm in Nevada, California. I am excited to welcome you, Vic. Where are you today? I'm in little Steventown, New York. It claims to, uh, that it's the only Steventown on earth. Uh, when you enter town, there's a big sign there. And uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's where we are. <laughs> Um, now, I, I discovered yesterday that your accent, for those of us on the West Coast, that is a New Jersey accent. Am I correct? Yes. I love it. It's just, it's, it, it's always a treat to hear a regional accent in California where we are. We speak, you know, very boringly. Um, can you, do you remember first kind of off the bat, do you remember the first thing you ever drew? Uh, probably uh, images of uh, combat. I was uh, I was a little kid, and uh, I loved those American history books, and uh, I loved the paintings that were in those those uh, American history books, uh, especially like on the Revolutionary War, or Civil War, or whatever. A lot of them were done by the great American uh, illustrators like Harvey Dunn and and Howard Pyle and uh, uh, N.C. Wyeth, people like that, that were illustrate that were filling those those publications, and I was just you know I was just fascinated by them, and and uh, that's what that was one of the things that I, uh, I tried to copy as a kid, a little kid, not well obviously, but um, not, it's not, this is not one of those Albrecht Durer stories where you see that drawing he did himself at thirteen and you're going oh. no my 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 situation was a slow starter. You know, can you tell me a little bit about your work has been seen on the cover of Rolling Stone. You um, create the artwork for all of Alta's fiction. You work on books. You're a combat illustrator. But your first gig, your first official gig um, is interesting. Can you tell us about that? Oh, uh, well, well, I was still in uh, Parsons. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh... This is one of the advantages of being in art school that, uh, especially when you're being taught by pros, that they have, they, they're coming in, they're, they're the people in the business. And back in uh, the, uh, the mid seventies, when I was studying at Parsons, uh, we had, we had nothing but, uh, but outstanding illustrators uh, who were instructors. And um, 
Well, I, I was scribbling all the time. I was, and at that time I was keeping an eye on politics. I, I was very interested in that. And our, our co-chairman of the illustration department, Murray Tinkleman, saw some of my sketches, my ideas, and he goes, oh, you've got to see J.C. Suarez, you know. J.C. was one of the other instructors. J.C. had been one of the original uh, art directors for the uh, op-ed page uh, for the New York Times. I think he had just, around that time, he had just left and had trans transferred that over to uh, George Del Merico, who was art directing. And um, anyway, uh, I went up the next flight of steps to where J.C. was teaching. And I said, Murray wants you to look at this. And J.C was smoking a cigar in, in, in class and he kind of like spread everything out, was looking at it, you know, flipping through and he goes, uh, go, see, uh, go see George, uh, uh, tell him I sent, you know? And I went over there, I went over to the Times uh, and um, I met uh, that and I was called upstairs and I went to see George Delmerico and uh, Lou Silverstein who was also one of the, uh, the, the big shots, uh, the giants behind the graphics department at that time at the, at the New York Times. And they looked through, through my sketchbook and, and, my, and, and a bunch of semi-finished work that I had done for class. And um, George says, ah, and he has this piece of paper in his hand. It's, 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 an, it's an essay and it's the next day's op-ed, one of the next day's op-ed essays. And he goes, I'll read this. Do you think you can do something with, with this? And I read it and I threw out an idea to him. He goes, yeah, that sounds good. Can you do that? Uh, can you do that here? Because it's got to go to print. And this was the day, this was the time, I should say, where uh, you, you still had art departments that actually had tools in, in the offices. And so I, I had like, I think a rapidograph and maybe an extra pen or something, but they had crow quills and they had all sorts of inks and, and I kind of did the job right there in the office and then uh, left. And the next day I, on my way to, um, I was working at a steel, uh, steel uh, cutting and perforating factory in New Jersey. And on my way, I picked up the New York Times and looked at it. And I said, wow, it, it ran. And, and it was kind of a bummer. Why? Uh, because we were, we were, when we're going through school, you're thinking, oh, the New York Times is like, the, to, to use uh, Norm Crosby's term, it's the pinnacle of your career to get into the New York Times. And here I was, I hadn't even been out of school. I still had another year left and I was in the New York Times. I was like, okay, so now what? It's, it's only got to go downhill from here, you know? Um, you ended up, I, and I'm getting a, a couple of uh, feedback here. Can you get a little bit closer to your mic and I'll back up from mine. I'm too loud and you're too quiet. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. So you you ended up um, next as a courtroom sketch artist. Well, it was one of the things I did once I got out of, uh, once I graduated from Parsons, I was doing a lot of work uh, for the New York Times for like the week in review section and for the uh, um, op-ed page at that time for Steve Heller and, and Eric Seidman who were uh, the art directors of those uh, sections. But I was also, uh, I also wanted to uh, do other types of work. And I grew up besides wanting to be a, a Looney Tunes kind of uh, illust cartoonist illustrator or someone like uh, uh, a David Levine, because in high school I used to go to, to uh, the library all the time and just look at the, the New York Review of Books, just to look at David Levine's drawings and first before I even read any of the articles. And, um, but then, that was that one thing. I, I wanted to be funny. I want. I, I loved the stuff that the Lampoon was putting out, the work that the Lampoon was putting out, work from Rick Meyerowitz, Demona Gorilla, uh, uh, Bob Grossman's Nixon as Pinocchio. That was the two double page uh, cover, and um, uh, I wanted to do that. But I also grew up, like I said before, I was I was very enmeshed in in like a, in realism too. And so I wanted to do that. And one of the things that 
uh, of that genre of realism that really captivated me was courtroom art. And I loved to watch Uncle Walter Cronkite and later Dan Rather on, on CBS uh, because they had Howard Brody, who was a California native, who used to teach at San Francisco Academy. Uh, one of the great uh, combat artists. He uh, was, was, uh, he was a giant and he was also one of the, the, the premier courtroom artists of that era. And I would turn on Uncle Walter, hope, you know, and, and just see what was the case that Howard was, was uh, doing drawings at, because I loved the energy and the immediacy of his drawings. I said, I'd like to do that too. So now I have a, uh, I have a split personality as an, as an, uh, with, with, as an illustrator. You're supposed to really go in one genre. You know, illustrators are supposed to be known for doing one thing. Uh, and I was wanted to do a lot of things. I wanted to draw realistically, but I also wanted to do very slapsticky, funny uh, gag kind of illustrations with, with gag punchlines, you know, a political figure slipping on a banana peel, that kind of thing. So I had these two worlds and I was able to kind of like drift into, uh, drift into each one occasionally, uh, more so I was in the world of illustration, standard magazine, newspaper work, uh, book work. But every once in a while I would get a call like say, from ABC local television and go to a trial. And uh, cause I brought my portfolio there. And, um, and then eventually I wound up going to the, my last real full, t uh, full gig as a, as a courtroom artist was the John Hinckley trial back in 82, I believe. Um, and uh, that's where I actually met Howard Brody and uh, who was sitting right in front of me on that first day in the courtroom. And uh, we became fast friends and he was a, one of the dearest friends and mentors. And, and, uh, and I've been very lucky in, in my life to have a lot of, uh, wonderful mentors and friends in, in, in illustration. Well, if it's, if it's okay with you, let's um, share some of your work. Let's give me a second here. Um, and I keep on falling back in my seat here and I know I'm, I'm probably not, uh, <laughs> when I do that, I drift out. We want to hear you, um, but, but let's also, you know, check out some of your, your work. So we have here a Rolling Stone cover. Now this is clearly editorial. Um, as as literal as it feels to me. Um, can you tell us what your process is on something like this? This is a Rolling Stone cover. Uh, the headline here is Trump the Destroyer. Um, where do you even begin? Do you get a phone call from Rolling Stone that says, do some, here's the, do you see the article in advance? Yeah, um, I've, the I've, worked, like? I've worked with Rolling Stone almost since the beginning of my career which goes back to the uh, mid to late seventies off and on. But then in the, in the, uh, in the nine, well, in, in the mid two thousands, I, I started working for them on a more regular basis. And I, I've worked with so many wonderful art directors there. And, uh, you know, as, as the business, as technology changes and the business changes, you, you wind up doing a lot of stuff by inter by internet by email by you know uh, sending ideas back and forth this uh illustration this cover was one of those great throwbacks to the good old days where we would go to art director we would sit with an art director in his office and you'd uh, kick around ideas and uh and you'd be tossing things back and forth and why does this work why does this not work and this is uh ironically this is one of those pieces where um, I was in town, uh, my wife uh, Terry and I were uh, subletting an apartment uh, in, in lower Manhattan and uh, Joe called me for an illustration to do a cover and I said, hey, I'm in town, why don't we, why don't I just stop up because uh, since this whole thing is just uh, really brewing right now, let's kick some ideas around and we sat down and um, we had a great time. We just uh, we were just throwing 
ideas. And this was actually one of my original thoughts, but then we spent the next couple hours just working up other ideas. And then when all, when all was said and done, we went back to this idea. Do you, for something like this, does any of your kind of like personal politics weave its way into your work or do you try and maintain some kind of no, not when, it comes, not when it comes to work like this. I, for the most part, I'm I'm kind of like in tune with with the edit with the the editorial content of the of the articles. So I have no problem uh, just actualizing the visuals for those. No, I, there's very few pieces that I've done, probably more in the beginning of my career, uh, certainly not not recently, where I did something that uh, kind of rubbed me wrong from a, from a, a political or uh, philosophical standpoint. Um, and I don't have to worry about that now because I don't go get those kind of calls anyway. Right, right. Where, when, when you're working on something like this, do you, what's this from? What's this image that we're- This was also for Rolling Stone. This was also for our Matt, Matt Taibbi series on, on uh, the Great Bank. Uh, collapse, uh, banking, housing, uh, collapse of 2008, and uh, who was consuming whom? Uh, who was, was the government actually uh, going to put us uh, some uh, curtailment on, on the banks, or were the banks actually uh, consuming um, government funds to keep themselves floating? All these banks and investment companies that uh, had so bankrupted themselves and bankrupted the, the country in, in the process. When you look at, this is amazing. Um, when you look at published pieces of your artwork, do you ever, are you, are you ever kind of completely satisfied and you're done with it? Or are you constantly looking at, oh, I would change this, I would tweak that? Um, that's, Yes, that's true. And as a matter of fact, it's funny. I just realized that the, I, I added one of the people in that in the section where it's got John Boehner and, and Mitch McConnell. Behind them was an elephant, is an elephant who I, after the fact, after this thing ran in the in the magazine, I said we forgot one person uh, who who you know was such a uh, played such a, a significant gadfly in the whole uh, no taxes thing uh and i can't remember his name right now but he was one of these guys who you know was against taxes who's one of the most he was one of the more difficult people to call uh to draw because he was uh just su such a, a a visually uninteresting human being but uh, <laughs> but after the fact i kind of erased that elephant out and put his face into oh really it. yeah just there's such own, a thing just my own uh, uh hanging up on the wall in the house Oh, wow. There's such a thing as a visually uninteresting human being. Absolutely. <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, this is a, this is a, another, uh, this is going back to the uh, Looney Tunes and, and having fun and you know, the, the spirit of the lamp, the old lampoons or mad magazine. Um, I, I was the illustrator, <clears throat> the designated illustrator for probably 15, 16 years for David Faraday. When, and when he was uh, writing for Golf Magazine. And uh, this was a piece he had done on the Olympics in, in Brazil. And I was just going to town with uh, uh, adding as many, uh, probably in, in apropos uh, images, but, but sort of, I guess, playing up his, his fears. Interesting. The, the longer I worked for, for Golf Magazine, the, the, the more in control of David Faraday's nose I, I got. Uh, <laughs> um, this is the last kind of, before we get into your work in, um, with kind of combat illustration and your work for Alta, this is the, can you, can you tell me about this editorial yes, piece? This was a cover for the American Bystander Magazine. It was a November issue uh, cover. And uh, here's where, going, you know, com in comparison to like, let's say the Faraday piece that we just saw before. And now I'm not really cartooning 
uh, or, or or going for that uh, that uh, funny satirical look anymore, or or less and less. Let's put it that way. And this was a kind of like a, a dark humor uh, fall issue kind of uh, illustration, so that uh, instead of uh, kids jumping into leaves are, they're, they're basically jumping into ashes right. this was during uh, this was kind of a, a, a response to the, the the crazy fires that were going out there on the west coast for you folks um speaking of intense imagery now we get into your your work with um, military combat can you how did that even where did this is more recent for you you've been doing editorial for so long for magazines like rolling stone um how did you get involved in military combat illustration initially it was through uh, a, a series of events one of them being um i had done a children's book with for sleeping bear press i uh, and uh, h is for honor and it was basically a book for military families uh, explaining to the kids what the parents were doing there were a couple of illustrations in there that related to the Air Force and the Society of Illustrators, of which I'm a member and I serve on the board. Um, they uh, they had a they've have a they have a government services committee that's been around forever, and it it's had a close association with the Air Force going back to when the Air Force was the Army Air Corps and not the U.S. Air uh, Air Force, and uh, going going back to well past World War II. And so it was suggested by the, uh, by the chairman, uh, John Witt, that I, uh, I uh, donate a couple of those illustrations I did of, that had Air Force themes from that book to the Air Force uh, in, at the Pentagon. And in order to get in, you know, as a way to get into the program and be sent on assignments, um, which I did. And I was going on, I find myself going on assignments to cover training exercises, uh, mostly training exercises with the with the Air Force, and right from the start, I said I don't want to do. I'm not going to do this stuff and do and and draw and paint airplanes or missiles or or, or hardware. That's not what I'm interested in. Let's go back again. Howard Brody. Howard Brody was one of my influences as a combat artist. Growing, looking at his work, and. Um, I wanted to do that. I wanted to be with the grunt, with the grunts. I wanted to be with the boots on the ground, and and uh, visually document their experience, and that's what I wound up doing. These those these are the pictures that we're looking at here are not from for the Air Force. These were actually um, from a mission that I was able to uh, arrange via the late Peter Kaplan. Uh, who was a wonderful editor who was working at Condé Nast at the time. And he got me, uh, he, he signed off on me reluctantly to go to Afghanistan. And I spent a few weeks there and I spent a, a couple of weeks out of that few weeks there uh, with an army dust off unit out in Kandahar province, the one, 152nd Arctic Thunder out of Alaska. And uh, the drawings you see here are drawings that were done uh, right on the spot uh, sitting in the back of the those dust off helicopters, where they were picking up the wounded. So extraordinary, uh, and, and, and done in real time, which meant that uh, pretty much I didn't touch them after after I got back. What what about kind of illustrating a moment like this is different than taking a photo? Why is why do illustrators um, even in real time, go into combat. How is it important? Can you talk a little bit about that? About the the difference. Um... I think what we're what if I can. I've never been able to successfully give uh, an explanation on the spot. I have a, always have great ideas when I'm by myself and I wonder about that. But when, when again, when the question like you. Uh, uh, just posed gets raised i think to myself so really what makes the difference the difference is here i'm a, a photograph will give you all the uh, the details uh it's objective a camera is objective the, 
photographer behind it is not objective. He's got, he's composing or she is composing and, and uh, is creating an image. But no matter what you do, a camera is getting all the details, which is important for people like us oftentimes after we get back from wherever we were to be able to go and, and reference back to what we, we took pictures of while we were drawing. But when you're drawing, you're focusing on what's catching your attention, what the story that you're trying to tell. And uh, so therefore, as you can see, I don't, you don't have all the paraphernalia on the floor of the, of the helicopter, of the Black Hawk inside that. I just have a, a uh, medic, uh, uh, an army medic hovering over an Afghan police officer who had just been uh, pretty well messed up. And uh, as, as we were on our way to the Afghan hospital over there in Kandahar. And that's what I was focusing on. Uh, there's a compositional element go happening here. And uh, I'm also, I love doing that. I, I, if I can do it at all, uh, just jot down notes, uh, observa observational notes as I'm drawing. Were you in the full gear? Were you wearing like body oh, armor? Yeah, you're, or? you're wearing flak. You're wearing flak. You're wearing Kevlar. You know, you, you are, uh, you are definitely in full gear. How did the uh, soldiers respond to your being there? Um, they were, you know, the, mili the military members are, are very accustomed to people who, uh, photographers who come in and draw. And uh, I mean, I'm sorry, photographers who come in, take a bunch of pictures and leave. Um, but somebody who comes in and is hanging with them for a couple of weeks and is just drawing, Initially, it seems like that's a weird kind of thing you're doing, but very quickly, especially when they start seeing the drawings, and especially if they, they happen to wind up being in the drawings themselves, they, they get the idea that you're, you're, te you're, you're, you're validating their experience by, by recording it. You are uh, putting them a, a little bit in, in a sense in history. By, by drawing this and, 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 and uh, visually documenting this. So they take, they take to it very well. And this was, yes, these uh, are obviously someone recovering. Yes, these were, this is the other side of war, the casualties. Um, and uh, I have been involved for, for years with, a, with, uh, with a, uh, something called the Joe Bonham Project, which was started by uh, a, a former Marine Corps combat uh, artist, designated combat artist, uh, Michael Fay. And uh, we went to the hospitals, uh, like either in Richmond or at uh, uh, Walter Reed, yeah. which was, had been, uh, uh, yeah, Walter Reed. And uh, we would go there to see those who were coming back. And oftentimes they had been very sick seriously wounded uh, and, uh, and, and visually document that, get that down for the record, the historical record. That's so powerful. But with the little boys, oh God. Yeah, um, and, and I confess, this is where the ca camera comes in. The, you know, things were not notched in on the, on the sketch pad, but then you're taking pictures. I think with Derek, uh, who, was on, who was on the bottom, that was pretty much done. A lot of that was done there. And I just was lucky enough. I had the, the photos to just go in and, and make sure I had the ta his tattoo correct or, or, or ex where things were placed. But um, you're, you're drawing on the spot there too. You're, you're working in real time. All right, let's move. Before we, we get to audience questions, which we have, let's talk a little bit about your work for Alta. Now, for, for Alta, you do something slightly different. In fact, in issue eight, we started including new fiction, short stories, um, original short stories in the pages of Alta. And Victor, you have been kind of our exclusive illustrator thus far and into the future for kind of adding imagery to fictional stories. 
Um, this is from the most recent issue, the art issue. This is um, Sleep Nights, a piece by our managing editor, Blaze Zariga. Can you tell us a little bit about your process here and how do you, does our, do you get a copy of the story first and, and start sketching? How does this work? I always get a copy of the story first um, and read it a number of times. It's funny that I have had sought for so long to be to to uh, to do like uh, satirical, funny kind of uh, work, humorous work, and not one of the pieces I've ever done for you has has had anything else but a a very serious theme. So this story came in, and 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 it was the writer, uh, Blaze, was telling it from in almost like a fragmented uh, yeah. bunch of uh, notes in, in a sense. There were vignettes that the story kept on jumping around uh, and, and uh, it felt very fragmented. And it took me a number of reads to start seeing what was going on. It made me think that if that was the case, I should probably treat the, uh, the illustrations as kind of fragments, observations. Uh, he's talking in this scene, he's talking about the pain that it was, he's a junkie. He's talking about the pain in his liver that he feels. And I just started, uh, I, I just started sketching out and uh, working off of some photographs that I found on, on Google and, so, and, and also just use my own hand. And, and then, put that into the finish. I love including the sketches because quite frankly, uh, my favorite part of any assignment is, is, the, is the sketch work. Just- Why? Because that's where the, that's where the real fun is happening for me. It's the, it's the idea process. It's, it's composing. Uh, and that's probably the, the time when in the studio where the, the, the studio is silent. I don't have jazz or classical or whatever playing. When I'm in the finish stage, when I'm going through the finishes, that's when I'm, I'm more concerned with the technique with the, and with the nuts and bolts of getting something done. Do you have music playing then? Yes. Or, oh, what or, you or, or audio books or podcasts or whatever. Usually, oh really? Usually mu music or or audiobooks. Interesting. So so when you're sketching you need complete concentration, complete silence. Yes, uh, at this uh, later stage in my life, yeah. Once upon a time I I could have all that stuff, a lot of noise going on around me. Uh, but the, the older I'm getting, the more I find myself much more comfortable if I'm working in silence during the idea stage. Uh, it just, I just can't deal with all the distraction. Can you now, what our audience is seeing now is a sneak peek here where the last two images are, these are, this is um, the next issue will be out uh, January 1st for, uh, for our winter 2022 issue. This is from the fictional story and you kind of had a, a personal connection to this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, Ali who wrote the story, um, she, it's about uh, a, uh, a woman who's dying of cancer. And in the, con in the process of the story, she's, she's kind of throwing it out to her husband to look for somebody, uh, at least for a, uh, to work off some steam. And, and she's, she's looking into call girl kind of services and stuff like that. The husband, as would be expected, would be expected is not interested in he's really not interested in, in, in uh, sex right now he's interested in ke keeping her alive and hopefully getting her better uh, when I read the story I found myself thrown back many years before when my first wife uh, was, was dying of cancer and uh, while the, the, the circumstances were different in terms of the, the plot a conversation like that can come up once or twice during the course of the illness. Like you got to do something, and it's or you got to do, or you got to really start thinking of uh, what happens after I'm gone. And that's the last thing 
uh, a husband is is interested in. So uh, you're you're concentrating on 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 getting better. And when I got the story, um, I, uh, I I called up John and we started talking about that. I said this is really hitting a personal uh, it's it's a personal note with me, which makes me really want to do this as as. Uh, uh, as personally as possible, as possible. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just felt I wanted to bring something a, a little more symbolic into this. It's beautiful. Um, again, everyone, that that issue will be available next month. Let's get to some audience questions. Um, do you ever use Photoshop? Um, you're often seen at an easel, there's no, I'm not seeing other, well, you're on a computer, obviously. Do you use digital tools at all? I use digital tools. I don't generally use digital tools to do finishes. I may use Photoshop to kind of like touch up a finished piece that I've scanned, maybe just add something, but uh, I don't do, I, I really don't do Photoshop. For, for finished work. I will use Photoshop and I, I've got a wonderful Cintiq and, and uh, to, to color in my sketches. So when I'm sending something to somebody, uh, I, I like to, I don't wanna color my, my original sketches because that's it. If, I've screw, if I screw it up, I gotta start all over. So I'd rather just scan the drawing and then just work out I, uh, color ideas too and send those options to the, to the client. Um, I, I have been using Photoshop. Uh, I did a book with Ryan Holiday last year uh, uh, on Marcus Aurelius, a children's book, and I did all drawings. Uh, and then I scanned and everything was scanned and then I, whatever color was added was added uh, via Photoshop. Interesting. Because right. again, I did not want to mess up uh, an original drawing. If I laid the wrong color in, I'm, I'm screwed. Let me, I, thank you. Robert Layton asks, illustrations for the Times op-ed page frequently have a visual punchline. Do you make up your own or were they assigned? No, if I made up any uh, punchlines in the early part of my career when I was working for the op-ed page or, or for anybody, uh, for Rolling Stone or anyone, if I'm doing it, working up a punchline, I'm, I'm usually doing Bugs Bunny, three <laughs> Three Stooges, Looney Tunes kind of uh, punchlines. Do you have favorite cartoonists? Do you still, are you still a fan of Looney Tunes? Do oh God, uh, that whole, that whole golden era of, of, of Looney Tunes, uh, Robert Cam, uh, Campbell and, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, Robert Clampett and, and Tex Avery and, and uh, Fritz Freeling and all those wonderful people. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the old Popeyes, the, the, the Max Fleischer Popeyes, all these great cart uh, cartoons. I grew up on that. And I was a real, I was a real snob as a kid. Really? Uh, eventually uh, watching uh, uh, car cartoons on TV. Once the Flintstones started coming in and Hanna-Barbera, I had a totally, uh, uh, I totally misunderstood Hanna-Barbera. They actually were quite a, a, a sophisticated operation uh, in terms of an animation studio. They had, did beautiful work, but they got to a point where they were doing things like, that, things like the Flintstones and Deputy Dog. And once I started seeing those cartoons, I was like, oh, this, I had been so spoiled by, by, the, uh, by Disney and by, and by Warner Brothers and, 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 and uh, the Fleischer Brothers. And they just, I knew the I knew the premise. I knew what they were doing. They were going more for the for the visual. I mean, for the for the the gag uh, uh, and the cultural reference in in the in um, in the Flintstones. There was a honey. It was basically the honeymooners in in, uh, in prehistoric times. So I got that, but I didn't like I didn't like the cartooning at all. Interesting. Um, last question, because we have gone over. Can you tell me a little bit about your work with inc inc incarcerated artists? Not incarcerated artists. I have done work 
And I doubt anybody will ever see it because I, I, I've done work with, um, through the Society of Illustrators with our director, Annel Miller, who, who, uh, uh, who is, uh, was very, well, and still is, we're, we're, we're on call at some point to go, go back there. But um, before, prior to COVID, we were going to Rikers Island and uh, Annel and, and some other members of the, uh, the Society of Illustrators would do art instruction with, with the uh, youthful offenders. Um, up to about 22 years old. And if they used to have the 16 to 18 year olders, but, the, but they got transferred uh, out of Rikers. And then for a, a longer time, we, were, we wound up working with the, with the 18 to 20s, 20, early 20s. And uh, I went there sort of like as the entertainment. I was, I was there to draw portraits. And El was doing instruction, teaching, working with the, getting them to use the creative, uh, tap their creative energies and and I was I was doing portraits and which was freaking them out because uh, they were just like blown away by what they were seeing and uh, their how they've been realized on paper drawing is magic one of my old instructors uh, and and uh, Murray Tinkleman used to say drawing is magic and it has a magical effect on people. And I think it's very true. I mean, we, we worked with some very tough, tough offenders in, in Rikers. And uh, uh, it's, it's weird to get that kind of uh, respect back uh, from them when you know that they've been getting the, the, the guards a hard time and stuff, and stuff like that. Uh, and in a sense, when we were there, we were kind of giving the guards a little bit of a rest too, because they were so focused on either doing the art or being drawn and just being mesmerized by the results um, that uh, it was it, it was it was it was beneficial to everybody. And it kind of like these these are human beings who never uh, probably never got any respect. Their only respect was to violence or, or, or criminality. Or just doing sh stupid stuff, and and, uh, and here somebody's drawing them, which is kind of like an acknowledgement yeah. of the humanity, regardless of what they've done. And um, they they appreciate it, whether you know, and I, and that's as that's that's as much of an impact as I can have. That's beautiful. Um, well, on that. Thank you. This has been an extraordinary um, learning experience for me. And, and I, I look at um, art and illustration uh, differently because of this conversation. So thank you, Victor. It's an honor to have you in the pages of Alta every quarter. Um, and I know we it's always love a fun, working with it's you. It's always a fun assignment working for Alta. Uh, it's always a challenge. And it always puts me right back into school uh, and trying to think I'm starting all over again with, with every job uh, in terms of trying to figure out how to solve a problem, which is exciting because it takes me out of a comfort zone. Um, well, it sounds to me like you love being outside of a comfort zone. So I'm glad we can participate in that. Um, before everyone bounces, I wanna let you know next week, we are excited to welcome the editor of Stranger's Guide, which is just such a cool magazine. Um, the next issue focuses on California, Kira brunner Don, the editor um, of Stranger's Guide is gonna join us and take us through their incredible new California issue. Um, again, this is recorded. We'll be up on altaonline.com later today. A gigantic thank you to Victor Yuhas for joining us. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for coming. Stay safe. Get boosted. Take care. Thanks. Bye.